welcome to another episode of The Conversation. For the past few weeks, we have been hosting this show as a platform where sensitive, often avoided topics are deeply analyzed and ventilated for the benefit of the public. We have not set out to ruffle feathers unnecessarily, but surely we're here for the conversation, no matter the topic. I am your host, Carla Barnett. Over the years, we have been hearing a lot about climate change, but it seems that climate change and the threat of global warming are still not clearly understood by many, mostly because it sounds too technical. So tonight we will try to break it down and clear up some of that confusion. And to that, joining me in this studio is Dr. Colin Young, who is the Executive Director of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, widely known as the Five Cs. Colin has a doctorate in ecology from the University of Connecticut and a Master of Science degree in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. He has also served as CEO in the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, and Sustainable Development. Welcome to the conversation, Colin. Thank you. And joining us virtually from Barbados is Elizabeth Riley, who is the Acting Executive Director of the Caribbean Disaster, Caribbean Emergency Disaster Agency, SEDEMA. Elizabeth has a master's degree in environment and development from the University of Manchester and a bachelor of science degree in geography from the University of the West Indies. She has over 20 years experience in the area of disaster management at the regional and international levels. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. It is great to have both you and Colin here with me this evening as we talk about climate change. We recognize that while we hear a lot about climate change, a lot of people are still not familiar with what that means. So we will begin this conversation with the fundamentals. What is the difference between weather and climate? Thank you. You Car go after okay. that, Colin. Um, uh, thank you, Carla, and, and good night to the listening uh, public. That's a very important question and one that is often, as you said, uh, uh, interchangeably used. But I want to answer that question by starting with two analogies. One <clears throat> is that think of the weather as your mood and the climate as your personality. Mm. Um, That's interesting. The idea is that when you go outside uh, in the day, it can be windy, it could be rainy, it could be sunny, it could be cold, it can be hot. That is your weather. Your climate now is what you expect over long term, your personality. So you're who you are, and that generally stays the, the same. And the other analogy is that the weather is what you get, and the climate is what you expect. Ah. So what you're getting in terms of the rain, again, uh, the coolness, hotness, cloudiness, your weather, and the climate is what you expect. And when I mean expect, we know that if I ask you right now what is going to be the weather like in June, you're probably going to say it's going to be rainy. Mm -hmm. And what is going to be the weather in, in December? We said it's going to be cool. Mm -hmm. Well, we, again, that's what you expect because it happens over a long period, period of, of time. time. Right. And all of our farmers and, and a lot of the way we work and live in some ways is dictated by what we expect to happen. So that is the difference between climate is over a long term while weather is the right now. So, so with, that, with that explanation, explain to us what is climate change then? What is global warming and climate change? Because if climate, as, as you say, is, is what you expect, Correct. but it is changing. So clearly what we are expecting is changing. Absolutely. In fact, global warming is one aspect of climate change. It refers specifically to the fact that global temperatures are increasing. Mm -hmm. When we say climate change, we are referring to not just only temperature. We're also talking about the changes in rainfall patterns. Sometimes you get a lot of rain, sometimes you get no rain, and you're also talking about wind patterns. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when temperature, rainfall, and wind patterns change over long periods of time, that is your climate changing. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that changing climate, there are a whole set of... What causes the temperature uh, to increase? <clears throat> That's another very good question. And, and that is um, largely because of what is called greenhouse gases. Okay. As they, and the greenhouse effect. 
And to, to really simplify that, I want the public to just imagine a greenhouse that is full of glass, and inside the greenhouse you have plants and, and whatever else that is in the house. The sun sends the rays down, it hits into, goes into the greenhouse, and some of the heat is going to uh, come back out of the greenhouse, but a lot of it is trapped by the glass. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the temperature inside the greenhouse increases and it gets hotter and hotter. Right. In the case of climate change, there is what is called the greenhouse effect, and you have these greenhouse gases. The big ones when it comes to climate change are things like carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide, and it's the same principle. Right. The sun hits the earth, a lot of that heat would have then hit back and go back out into space, but it's trapped by these gases, right. these greenhouse gases, a significant amount of it is trapped. And as a result, over time, the temperature of the Earth is increasing. Right, and it, and it leads to... And it leads to a whole suite of issues that includes things like sea level rise. Um, it includes the melting of the glaciers, which would contribute mm -hmm. to sea level rise. It also leads to things like increased droughts, right. uh, increased flooding and rainfall. Uh, it includes even to sargasm in terms of right. uh, how it might Which impact. Which we are experiencing across uh, the Caribbean. Absolutely. Right. And then also in terms of pests and diseases. So climate change causes and a And hurricanes. hurricanes. Let's not forget hurricanes. In fact, a significant, uh, there are lots of data to mm -hmm. suggest, in fact, in the most recent State of Caribbean mm -hmm. Climate Report, the UWI Climate Modeling Group is saying that um, by the year 2100, we mm -hmm. should see an 80% increase in Category 4 and 5 hurricanes. Ah, which, is, which is a good place for me to switch to ensure that we bring in Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you are heading the SEDEMA operation, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, which is um, very much involved in helping us to manage the the in disaster events that affect us across the, the, the region. Can you, can you tell us um, what the mandate of SEDIMA is and which countries are part of SEDIMA? Just tell us about SEDIMA because we hear about it um, from time to time, but um, let, let's, let's hear yes, so what SEDIMA is about. Good evening, Carla, and thanks so much for having me mm -hmm. on the program. So SEDIMA, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, is an institution of the Caribbean community. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have a specific mandate that's indicated in the revised Treaty of Chagaramas. And essentially, the agency does five things. We mobilize and coordinate disaster relief. And what that means is humanitarian supplies that are needed in the aftermath of emergencies, so basic food stuff, water, et cetera. We work with our countries to what we call mitigate or reduce the consequences of disasters. And this can include interventions such as promotion of things like building codes. We also provide comprehensive information on disasters. And this information is provided both in the aftermath of events. So for example, with the Soufriere volcano eruption, which is currently ongoing, we provide what are called situation reports, which provide basically a, a status or an overview of what is happening on the ground and what the needs are. But we also serve an information function in non-emergency times. And on the SEDEMA website, you can find information on disasters around the region, as well as disaster information related to sectors like tourism on what we call our geocris. Okay. Um, we also, the fourth area that we treat is really encouraging disaster loss reduction through various means of cooperation. So we always say that a disaster manager, whether it's national or regional level, does not do their work on their own. We have a whole arsenal of other agencies that we work with, um, included agencies like the five Cs, technical agencies like the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology, but very importantly, also our development partners, including the UN family. So we work with them. We have memoranda of understanding with them in terms of how we're going to cooperate and that's a very important part of the coordination function that we undertake. 
Right. And finally, mm -hmm. the fifth area that we're mandated to address is really assisting our participating states in maintaining a minimum level of capability for disaster response. And we do that through a range of interventions, including training through our regional training center, which is based in Barbados. Uh, we work with them on exercising. Uh, we provide uh, uh, various guidance documents, policy documents for our, our countries to use um, in situations where it may not be the easiest thing for them to develop those mm -hmm. guidelines and tools on their own. We as a regional agency develop those and set the standards within the system. So those are the five areas that Sedima covers. So, so, so essentially you are the major coordinator of preparedness for and response to any natural disaster that's, that's heading or that's passed through our region. And um, you, you do that at the regional level and you also help the national level organizations get their skills and, and organizational capabilities up, up as, as, as much as we can. It's a very important agency. Um, let me ask Colin to tell us a little bit about 5Cs because 5Cs is located in Belize. It's yes. been operating, I think, since 2005. Yes. So tell us what, what 5Cs is about. Uh, like Sedima, 5Cs is an institution of the Caribbean community. Mm -hmm. uh, headquartered in Belize and opened its doors since 2005. Uh, the Five Cs has a mandate from the heads of government uh, to coordinate the region's response to climate change. Right. And like Liz's Institute, we do that through a variety of means, one of which is um, looking at how do we get the data to really inform decision making. Mm -hmm. This is scientific <clears throat> data. Scientific data. Right. And we do that through partnerships. Partnerships are absolutely critical to the work that we do. Uh, with our regional and international agencies. Uh, one of the key roles that uh, we play is, uh, for example, we have automatic weather stations all over the, the Caribbean, along with coral reef early warning systems, and that is collecting data on a real-time basis. Right. That then feeds into uh, the Met offices and CIMH, and from that they can use the data to help with forecasting mm -hmm. um, and also uh, capabilities to down, to down scale global climate models uh, into regional models so that the data is more applicable to right. what we do here. The second big area that the center works in is by helping countries uh, to obtain climate finance mm -hmm. to do climate resilience work within right. the member states. So right. whether that is to look at how do we use renewable energy where it is to become uh, adapting to climate change right. uh, by whether we use nature-based solutions like protecting mangroves uh, and watersheds, mm -hmm. or also in terms of uh, producing early warning systems right. um, that can help guide the decision makers as to uh, disaster management, which right. again feeds directly into so what so so does. so. It, 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 let, let me put it this way: um, Sedima deals with the weather effects you deal with the climate effects. Correct. That sounds about right. That sounds about <laughs> right. And, and what is really, I think, um, critical uh -huh. is that while we are different organizations, mm -hmm. um, our work absolutely intersect. Absolutely. And the, the partnerships within the region, like with Asedema and mm -hmm. CIMH and, and CARICOM, the other CARICOM right. family, uh, when we put all of our technical expertise uh, together, we right. really ought to then be able to provide the kind of guidance to our policymakers, right? So that we can they can make the best decisions when it comes right. to things like information for, yes. for for decision making. Elizabeth, um, what what are the challenges that you face in Sedima in providing disaster relief after climate uh, disaster or any other natural disasters in the ongoing disaster that's happening in uh, Saint Vincent at the time? Well, thanks so much, Carla. And I, I'm happy that you spoke to other disasters and other hazards as well, really, mm -hmm. because the remit of Sedima, of course, it includes the climate related hazards, which were right. alluded to by Colin, but we also cover seismic related hazards. Right. We're dealing with the recent volcano um, from the 
climate related hazards, which include not only cyclones, but severe weather events. We also have, and drought. Drought. We also have right. secondary hazards, which result, which include storm surge and landslides as well. So, and, and as well as health related hazards. So we're dealing with COVID-19 as well. Right. So I, I, I want to make that point because the, the, the multi-hazard nature of our region is, is just a reality that we face. Right. And uh, in terms of the kinds of challenges that we face, well, they're, they're diverse because what we have seen over time as a result of the changing climate and also because of climate variability is, as Colin indicated, we are seeing events that are much more intense. Right. Um, even with respect to the severe weather events, we're getting the types of intensity of the rainfall, the amount of rainfall that's happening over shorter periods of time. Um, these have all become very, very significant. And, and much more frequent. Yes. Larger and, and more absolutely. frequent, right. And, and much more frequent. And in addition to that, what we're also seeing is that the events tend to happen very quickly one behind the other. Mm -hmm. And it's a phenomenon we call the cumulative event event right so right. for example last year in belize when belize was not directly impacted by hurricanes eta and iota but what happened is that the, even though the eye did not pass over belize what we saw happening was that was that the feeder bands around right. the eye of the system brought significant rainfall to belize and Absolutely. even before the country could undertake the comprehensive damage assessment from the first system. The, the next system. one came. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely correct. So exactly. these are some of the these are some of the challenges that we are seeing, and mm -hmm. it's really challenging the national level systems to be able to um, quickly um, undertake an assessment of exactly what has transpired. Mm -hmm. um, we're also seeing that we're having multi-country impacts. So we saw this in 2017 with hurricanes Irma and Maria, where at one point, nine mm -hmm. of at the time, or eight, at the time we had 18 Salima states, we now have 19, but nine of those states were actually under threat at the, at same, the same time. time. At and the same time. That was, that was really unprecedented. Right. And the way how we operate in the Salima system, it's about horizontal cooperation. We as sister nations, we assist one another right and to provide additional support to any impacted state we essentially borrow personnel who we have tra trained and maintained mm -hmm. their skill sets over years from one country and we transfer them into the impacted state or states for a period of time so we really were quite stretched in 2017 mm -hmm. having to respond to four of our participating states at the same time at the same time at the same time our viewers we will take a short break and be right back to continue this very important conversation about why we're seeing more intense storms droughts and floods in belize and in the wider caribbean we will be right back Welcome back to the conversation. I am your host, Carla Barnett. Tonight, I am speaking with the executive directors from two regional agencies, Dr. Colin Young from the Five Cs and Elizabeth Riley from Sedima. And they are breaking down and demystifying climate change for us. And we will move on now to talk about climate change and the impact in our region. Um, one of the things that Elizabeth said, Elizabeth, in, in, in the first, um, part of our show is that it's not only about responding to climate or weather related events, but you deal with all disasters within the region. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you are working with St. Vincent to assist in the efforts um, as a result of the, the, the Sofer volcano that, that's been, uh, you know, really causing a lot of havoc on that island and on neighboring Barbados as well. Yes, yeah, so the La Super event began in late December of 2020, and Sedima has been supporting St. Vincent and the Grenadines since then. 
Our work has principally been around the strengthening of the national disaster plan, particularly the annex, which looked at the volcanic hazard and work with the country to develop the details of operating procedures, for example, related to evacuation. We did work with them on shelters. There was quite a bit of work to do to make sure that the shelter management system was robust, even as the effusive eruption was going on before it transitioned right. to the explosive eruption on April the 9th. Well, we also worked quite a bit uh, between December and the beginning of April on resource mobilization. We had prepared a consolidated budget with NEMO, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, that's the National Emergency Management Organization. Right. And uh, the budget reflected the costs associated with preparing St. Vincent and the Grenadines for an explosive event but also looking at the contributions from other regional agencies, right. specifically SEDEMA, the regional security system, because of course, security is a significant issue in every- In every um, disaster. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. The Caribbean Public Health Agency, because this eruption, as you know, took place within the context of- In the of middle of COVID. COVID-19. Yes. I, uh, if, if we were in doubt of the multi-hazard nature of our region, I think this has really demonstrated it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also um, included in the budget costs related to the Seismic Research Center. And uh, the reason I emphasize this point is to pick up on a point that Colin made earlier about the fact that the regional response mechanism which Sedima coordinates is really a system. Mm -hmm. And the regional agencies come together and we have to work collaboratively. So the science related to the volcano and what we would expect from the volcano was very much dependent on information coming from the Seismic Research Center. Right. You absolutely can't do its work, not in an effective way, without an understanding of the science. Right. So since, since the explosive eruption on April the 9th, we've been engaged in a number of ways um, we expanded our footprint on the ground um, from March the 1st. We'd actually had personnel on the ground in St. Vincent assisting in the Emergency Operations Center, providing technical advice to country. Um, since then, we expanded the number of deployments onto the ground. We deployed the CARICOM Disaster Relief Unit, also known as the CDRU. And this is coordinated in collaboration with the regional security system, which is also based in Barbados. And we have, um, we had initially 16 persons on the ground. We're actually expanding that footprint over the next couple of days um, by another six or so, just to beef up some of the specific skills that we see are needed on the ground. And that relief unit has been very instrumental in supporting the relief management and the logistics on the ground. Um, right. They supported St. Vincent and the Grenadines with the setup in collaboration with the World Food Program of a logistics hub, actually at the old Arnesvale Airport. Um, for those of you who are familiar with right. uh, St. Vincent, so it's a big, uh -huh. very nice big open space. Right. And what we're doing there is reducing congestion at the port as the relief items come in via container. So they're being moved from the port directly to, to the Arnesvale. Right. Absolutely. Right. And we're un unstuffing the containers there and then doing the distribution to the shelters and to other distribution points in country. How, how many people are, are in shelters uh, as, as of now? Uh, just over 4,000 are still right. in public shelters. However, there are a significant number of persons who are actually housed in private um, right, the displaced, private homes, right, friends right. and family. So the, the, the displacement is still significant. And uh, the, the estimated numbers who've actually been displaced is from the National Emergency Operations Center up to yesterday was just over actually 23,000 persons. Right, that's, that's, a, that's a number that, have, that, that we've been hearing, over 20,000 going up to almost 25,000 even as the volcano has sort of quieted down but it's not asleep it can it it can um can come back um colin here in belize we have experienced um heat 
drought, insect outbreaks, as well as wildfires. We had a little one in my neighborhood earlier today. Um, we had major agricultural losses in 2019 and 2020 when we went from severe drought to major flooding. Uh, can we attribute these events to, to climate change? Absolutely. Uh, when you look at the data, again, it, it's suggesting that what we're seeing is increasing temperatures and we're seeing changing precipitation patterns. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to a point I made earlier. The, the farmers, for example, I come from a village and farmers in my village used to know that this time of year you're cutting down your plot of land. Mm -hmm. um, so that this is the hottest month. Mm -hmm. And then what you would do is you would burn it mm -hmm. and then you will start to plant your crops mm -hmm. starting in June. Why? Because that is when the rains right. should come. So you prepare your cotton, you prepare to, April to and cut. May. And again, so the, the expectation is that mm -hmm. the, the, what the rain should come in June. What we are seeing now is that climate change is causing uh, changes in the, in, the, in the pattern where uh, the rainy season sometimes takes long to come, mm -hmm. where sometimes in the dry season you have floods, and in the rainy season you have a drought, mm -hmm. or you have a, a long drought. Right. That, that, and all of these things. And of course, when you have droughts, that means that the normal rainfall that you expect does not come. Does not come. And when it doesn't come, the little water that is in the soil evaporates and it dries out the soil. Mm -hmm. It also dries out forests. Right. So when, you, when somebody lights a fire in a nearby uh, piece of farmland that escapes into the forest, it's so dry, it's like a tinderbox, right. and it burns. Um, and then, of course, the hotter the temperature, we also see uh, pests that are increasing. Right. Uh, all of these things are, are unusual in the sense. We would have had pest outbreaks, we would have had some droughts, but as you both mentioned earlier, what we're seeing is that the frequency of droughts are increasing. The frequency of floods are increasing. Uh, we're getting a lot of rain in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, rather Which than is what happened last correct, year. Rather right. than a, over a long period right. of, of, of time. Right. So climate change impacts a lot of things. In fact, all the sectors that we are interested in, it impacts. Mm -hmm. It impacts the tourism industry. It impacts the health sector. It impacts right. agriculture. It impacts... Uh, something that people don't think about a lot is the heat stress. Right. For those people who work outside, like construction workers and farmers, what they're witnessing right now is an increase in the number of hot, hot days. Right. Days like over 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes so uncomfortable to be outside that the heat stress is increasing. Um, and while COVID is not a climate-related event, we do have other uh, diseases like chikungunya and malaria and these other diseases that we know that climate change impacts as well. Right. So it really has a great impact on the way we live and our, on our livelihoods. With, with, with specific reference to agriculture, how can we improve the awareness of farmers and uh, citizens generally on the effects of climate change and, and how can we help them to adapt so that they're not so negatively affected when, when the expected rains don't yeah. come? The, the first thing we have to do um, is to avoid talking about climate change in the future in a, on a time scale that a lot of people don't necessarily care about. Mm -hmm. When you hear things like, for example, by the year 2100, you know, that sea level rise would be X and the temperature would be this, um, you know, that's a time span that is too long, even 2050 mm -hmm. and even 2030. What farmers want to know is how can, what can I do now that would help me in, in knowing whether I should plant my crops in June? Mm -hmm. Um, and so what the, this comes to about uh, early warning systems where we can, through weather forecasts, we can say to the farmers, and nowadays we can have an app, mm -hmm. you know, that allows this to, be, to go out, informing right. them. There are parts of Africa where this is used widely right. and very effectively. All the smartphones are brought into smart use, right? So people can, can delay uh, the planting. Of course, we also have to look at the getting climate resilient crops. Right. Um, those crops that the seeds, they're uh, engineered um, to be able to grow in less, less, less moisture water. and right. less water. Right. So we have to make those, these more um, affordable 
and accessible to farmers. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the old age, uh, age old tested strategies of educating our children mm -hmm. in schools are critical right. because when right. they go home, they can also impart this um, to farmers. So we have to move away from the technical jargon and, and make climate change very relatable because they're seeing it, right. they're witnessing it. Um, and while they might not call it climate change, so to speak, they realize that their losses are increasing mm -hmm. and that more and more they're not getting the kind of yields right. from their farm that they used to. Right. So what our job now is to work with our partners and work at the national community levels to try to uh, inform all of the stakeholders of how is it that they can adapt uh, to climate change by utilizing various strategies. Right, and continue to grow food. And food security food. becomes an issue because Absolutely. of climate change. Um, Elizabeth, in the region, we are also seeing declining water supplies um, across um, the whole region, uh, reduced agricultural yields, as well as flooding and erosion in coastal areas, sargassum and all of that that's happening. Does Sedima play a role in addressing any of these issues? Well, with respect to the hazards uh, related to the water, mm -hmm. um, on flooding and drought, um, absolutely yes. On the drought scene, we collaborate very closely with the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. Right. In fact, we have an ongoing program where we're looking at supporting states in the development of drought plans, particularly for the agricultural sector. This is something we've been doing for Mm, maybe the past four or five years or so, right. and we have another iteration of that um, initiative coming up very shortly. Um, with respect to matters of flood mitigation, yes, we work with the University of the West Indies as well as the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology on the science around the flood modeling, mm -hmm. um, and countries are able to get a measure of technical support from those institutions. Um, in assisting right. them with their flood, flood mapping, which is very important. You, you have to understand the hazard first to be able to address it. So that's a very important um, first step as well. Okay. okay. Lots, lots, lots of good stuff happening. According to NASA, hurricanes will become stronger and more intense. And the intensity and frequency and duration of North Atlantic hurricanes, as well as the frequency of Category 4 and 5 hurricanes, have all increased since the early 1980s. What can we expect if the climate continues to warm at the rate that it is warming? Because, you know, you hear about slowing down the rate at which it will. Yeah. What can we expect if we do nothing? Well, we, what we can expect is that the situation will get a lot worse. Um, as I said earlier, under various models, we recognize that the Caribbean is warming. And it, uh, and it is warming and will warm significantly if we do nothing mm -hmm. Uh, or if we stay in the current course. When it comes to hurricanes, I said earlier that the forecasts, the predictions are that 80% increase in category four and five hurricanes. Now for us in Belize, um, uh, certainly a lot of us are too young to remember some of the very strongest hurricanes we've had, but we can see what happened in Dominica, the Bahamas, right. um, and Puerto Rico, and, and Grenada, and other countries where we had massive hurricanes that destroyed over 100% of GDP right. um, and caused absolute devastating damage. We had one damages. that caused 200% of, of, of GDP. 200% um, of GDP. And we had in the case of, of a couple of years ago with Barbuda, where the entire island was had to be yeah, evacuated because essentially every house uh, was destroyed. These things cause a serious impact on, on development. In fact, in some cases, it puts back the country uh, decades. Mm -hmm. And that's just from the, the, the hurricanes. Uh, what we often don't see is the small annual impacts of mm -hmm. hurricanes from droughts and from floods. Uh, right. in, in the case of Belize, every year there are damages from climate-related events that are equivalent to 7% of GDP. Right. To put that into perspective, the entire economy uh, on a good year without COVID was growing at about you know two three percent, and then you're losing in damages to infrastructure mm -hmm. to in crops seven percent of, right. of GDP. So what we are seeing also is that the sea level will continue to rise. 
We are already witnessing... By, uh, by how much? We, we are hearing that sea level will rise one to eight feet by 2100. What does that mean in terms of our coastline, in uh, terms of small islands? What does that really mean? Well, it, it means that uh, the predictions are that in the Caribbean, sea level, well, sea level has been rising at about 2.5 millimeter uh, per year. Um, and for every one millimeter of, of rise, beach, the beach retreats 100 times that, mm -hmm. right? So um, the higher the sea level rises, the impact on beaches by the erosion is significant. So if it rises one foot, you're talking about a hundred times. Yes, a hundred. Yes, right? A hundred okay. feet of, of beach. So immediately now a number of things come to play. If you think about all of the tourism industry, uh, sorry, all the resorts that are on the coastline, um, this kind of, of rise, mm -hmm. unless you build seawalls, you're going to lose those, tell, those tell, properties. In, in the case of Belize, for, for our audience here, give us an example of a place where we're seeing that already happening. Well, we see that in Monkey River, we're seeing that in Placencia, we're seeing that in Hopkins, we're seeing it in San Pedro. And under various models, and mm -hmm. we've, we have some models for Belize, all of those islands will become uh, uninhabitable. Uh, uninhabitable. Because, um, of the, they're just at sea level. Belize right. City. Uh, our largest city, in fact, the whole Caribbean, 70% of the Caribbean's population is coastal. Right. And so under various climate change scenarios, you're talking about not only losing land and displacing people, you're also threatening things like your utility infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about BEL, in the case of Belize and the utility companies in, in Barbados and other Caribbean islands that are very close Mm -hmm. to the sea. Right. In under sea level uh, rise scenario, these infrastructure will be threatened and in some cases would be flooded. So the cost would be devastating. Um, so sea level rise would increase, temperatures would increase, and then of course you would see things like more frequent fires and, and droughts. Mm -hmm. um, and it requires a rethink because the scientists are telling us that we have about 10 years. Ten. Ten years um, from globally to be able to keep global temperatures from rising above 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit uh, as per the Paris Agreement. Right. If we lose that window, in other words, the world... If we do not keep the temperature from rising that 1.5 degrees within the 10-year period. Uh, after that, it becomes very difficult and right. too expensive um, to try to keep global temperatures... Uh, and when you look at the projections of what would happen to the Caribbean, uh, at a, at a, if we exceed 1.5, it's devastating. It's absolutely uh, devastating. devastating. Our coral reefs under that scenario um, mostly will, will, will die. die. And, will and die. if you think about fishing industry, if you think about the tourism industry, nobody flies all the way from the, U the, the United States to come and see um, bleached corals or, or rubble. Right. Um, and so what we are trying to do from the Climate Change Center point of view is to try to use this information um, so that, as again, the policymakers uh, mm -hmm. can um, partly uh, make the case that the international community needs to do more to assist our, our countries in mm -hmm. the region to adapt um, to climate change by providing financing, among other things. And, and at... at rates that are commensurate with the level of risk and vulnerability that we bear, because that's, that's also part of, part of what we, we need to recognize. One of the things that we also need to recognize is that there may be a relationship between climate change and our health. And um, Elizabeth, I don't know if you, you are, um, are, are able to share with us any views on the relationship between climate change and our, on our health. Uh, yes, I can, Carla. And the, the thing about climate change is that it affects um, social and environmental conditions which impact on our health. So mm -hmm. it has implications for air and um, safe drinking water, as well as Colin mentioned the whole aspect of food, having sufficient food and also secure shelter. So I think probably three key things I could flag um, one is really related to extreme heat, right. and Colin raised that when he was talking about increasing temperatures, and already we're seeing 
heat waves being a, a feature now within our region. And of course, heat waves have particular implications, particularly for elderly persons who are in vulnerable groups. And this is certainly something that we have to look at. There also is evidence that pollens and other allergens are higher in extreme heats as well. Um, the second major category, I think, is related to the issue of natural disasters and what happens with respect to the variation in health patterns. So what we're seeing is that when we have um, increasingly variable rainfall patterns, that it affects the level of our freshwater supplies. And when we have situations where there's a lack of safe water, let's say if we're having extreme drought, we can have compromising of our hygiene. Um, it could increase the risk of certain types of diseases, um, which, for example, could cause uh, diarrhea. And this has particular implications for young persons. Um, water scarcity also leads to drought and famine. And uh, on the other extreme, if you're getting extreme floods and precipitation taking place, what can happen there is that you can have contamination of your freshwater supply, um, which is a, a threat of its own kind, as well as the heightened risk of waterborne diseases. We have um, creation of breeding grounds for disease carrying right. vectors. And already we're seeing um, implications for diseases such as dengue um, in the region. Right. And I think the third area is really related to the patterns of infection. And this is linked um, also to the um, transmission by the vector-borne diseases as well. So there's a whole range of implications related to climate change and health. And certainly this will also have financial um, mm -hmm. implications and social implications as well. Because within our region, people are absolutely our most valuable resource. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Elizabeth. Let's take a short pause on this discussion and take a short commercial break. We will be right back to discuss what we can do to mitigate the impacts of climate change. I am Carla Barnett. In this final segment, we want to discuss what actions can be taken at the country level and at the individual level to mitigate the impacts of climate change. When I listen to both of you, I sense a great urgency to address these climate-related issues. Why do you think the general population doesn't feel the sense of urgency? I, I'll take this ah, one first, and then Liz <laughs> can, can come in. Uh -huh. A part of it, I think, has to do um, with our inability to communicate to the public uh, on this issue of climate change. I think what we need to start doing is to talk to them on, on how climate change is impacting their lives directly. So to move it from a theoretical conversation to one that is based on, on, on realities that they're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, human beings are generally a species that uh, don't do very well uh, on the long-term planning. Mm -hmm. uh, it is like if I tell you, you know, 20 years from now something would happen to you if you, uh, if you get diabetes or you would get high blood pressure if you keep drinking 10 Cokes a day. Um, the time frame is such that we really would start to do things We don't now. get that sense of urgency. We don't get that sense of urgency. Right. Um, and I feel as though climate change for, most, for the most part has been about future things that ought to, to happen mm -hmm. when in fact there is... Uh, a lot of what is happening now, as Elizabeth right. was saying, that is impacting uh, your lives. Ultimately, though, uh, we are a species that worry about the future for our children. Right. Um, and so while I might not, in my own life, worry about 20 years from now for me, I do worry about what would happen to my children. Right. Um, and so we also have to, to utilize that avenue to be able to impress upon them uh, the need for us to act. Now, the need for us to act is at at least three levels mm -hmm. and one of them has really nothing to do with us directly in the sense that the problem that we have for climate change is because the wealthy developed countries are the ones that are burning fossil fuels they are the ones who 
are deforesting large mm -hmm. amount of, of the forest. And they're the ones who are using a huge amount of, of coal right. and, and, and fuel for cooling and for transportation. When they burn these things, they release, they release the CO2 and the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. What the Caribbean region is very tiny relative mm -hmm. to the world's population. And our greenhouse gas emissions as a region is very, very minuscule. minuscule. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were to disappear from the face of the earth... It would make it, no difference. Really. And so the international community right. is the one really who has to ensure that they put in place me mechanisms to mitigate the amount of greenhouse gases that are going right. Uh, right. into the atmosphere. At our regional level, we are concerned mostly with all of the effects of climate change right. um, that we are seeing every day that is impacting kids, impacting women, dispro dispro disproportionately impacting the vulnerable groups. Right. Um, and also we see it because uh, on the road to Belmopan, we just got a the, the bridge that is being fixed, right? Because that was washed away by uh, an eighty-year flood. Right. We lost the Kendall Bridge right. uh, a few years before that because of a hundred-year flood, um, and we are seeing these things happen more and more. So we are the, the at the national government level. There is focus on how do you look at climate resiliency and building resiliency, mm -hmm. and this is the case for all of the the countries in the region. Right. And then, of course, at the individual level, um, there are things that we can do. Um, they're small, but if enough people do them, uh, it does make a difference. Okay. Things like, for example, we, we cut down forests uh, indiscriminately sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and when we cut forests, not only are we reduce, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but we're also destroying um, the biodiversity. And if we clear down enough forests, Mm -hmm. One of the impacts of wide-scale deforestation is that you change the local weather patterns right. because there is less evaporation of water out of the plants and, and that water doesn't circulate and come and, back and, as And when fall. it rains, tell me if I'm wrong, when it rains, the water also runs much faster and takes off the topsoil. Absolutely. So there's erosion and, um, and again, uh, you see that it, it washes... Um, things in, in its path, and then that, that ends mm -hmm. up into the reef. And Belize is a, is a coastal country that has the second right. largest barrier reef in the world. And that increased sedimentation, uh, if you clear the mangroves especially, that right. gets Goes further right out, onto the reef. And then right. it kills the corals, and it impacts your seagrasses, and you, next thing you know, the nursery uh, for fish uh, is impacted, and it's our feedback loop that impacts right, right. now the tourism industry. Right. Elizabeth, um, how urgent is it for us to take action in the Caribbean? Um, is it really up to us? What, what role um, do we play among ourselves and within the international community in this global uh, climate change discourse? Yes, Carla, it is absolutely critical, and uh, I support everything that Colin has indicated. In fact, I think we need to change our messaging, just the just fundamental messaging around climate change to a, a catchy slogan like maybe climate change, it's happening now. And then we start to paint the picture about what we've already seen in terms of the mm -hmm. rainfall patterns, what we're already seeing in terms of the cyclones, not just the cyclones, but also the severe weather events, what we're seeing with respect to drought. And I think because persons are experiencing in a lot of the Caribbean states drought, They're, they know the reality of mm. turning on that tap and nothing is coming through that right. tap. And they know the reality of, you know, measures being put in place where you can't go outside and wash your car using your portable water, etc. So I think the, the key messaging, there, there has to be a, a, a rigorous and a sustained um, communications campaign with change messaging around the whole issue of climate change. I think that's the absolute first thing. Um, I also think that there are measures that will have to be looked at in terms of how do we better bring the science and apply it to the practical decision making mm -hmm. that, that's taken place. So one, one of the things that I have recognized is that we are doing so much excellent work. For mm -hmm. example, within the climate studies group at MONA, 
Colin mentioned the downscaling of the climate models, the work that's come out in the State of the Caribbean Climate Report of April last year. But a lot of this information, the scientific information, it stays within that scientific realm. And I think we still have to bridge that divide between Oops. the science and the practitioners. Right. And to work more closely together. So if Dr. Taylor at um, the Mona Climate Studies Unit, you know, produces the State of Caribbean Climate Report, the question that we are asking as practitioners, and then what? And so what does that mean? Mm -hmm. and, and what does that now trigger us to have to do? Right. What does it mean in terms of the policy implications? What does it mean in terms of the development decisions that we have to make? So Colin talked about the various scenarios of the sea level rise. And yes, this is well documented on the scientific side, but the question is, have we now translated it into the actions that are being undertaken by our physical planning develop, um, department in country? <laughs> have, have they looked at it to say, okay, well, in these particular scenarios where we understand that we're going to lose this amount of beachfront or this amount of our coastal areas, mm -hmm. what does that mean in terms of our future um, development planning right. I, I right. also so, so we have to find to we have to find a way of translating that scientific information into Absolutely. yes into information that ordinary people can yes. can relate with so they can understand how urgent all of this is because it is really very urgent and in fact you know right what is happening right now for example in the banking industry and the insurance industry they're mm -hmm. starting to uh, appreciate um, the risks that climate change mm -hmm. brings to their portfolio. For example, if I go to a bank and, um, and I wanted to build a resort on some coastal part of, of the Caribbean, and I'm going to use the land for collateral, the question that the banks ought to really be asking is what is going, and my, my, pe my period of the loan is going to be 30 years. Mm -hmm. The question that they need to be asking, what is going to be the state of that land 30 years from now mm -hmm. Uh, with a climate change scenario or um, in terms right. of sea level rise. Right. Um, and, and all of a sudden you see now that the very land that is there may not be there because of, of various sea level rise. So Liz is absolutely mm -hmm. um, correct in terms of the need to translate this into tangible um, policy making decisions right. that we see. Whether that's based on where a new community is going to be located, whether you're going to build a road, and if you're going to be building a road and you know it's right along the coast, mm -hmm. are you planning with climate change scenario in mind, or are you just building for building a right. road? Right, and sake? we in, in Belize, we certainly have had the situations in which whole communities have disappeared because of, yes. of a hurricane or a, a, a whole coastal area has... We're dealing with with Monkey River right now and all that erosion, and so Thousands we're we're feet, yeah. yes, we are we are living it already. So it's not it's not um, impossible for us to share that. Well, this is about climate change. Looking looking through the lens of both Sedima and the Five Cs, what needs to be done at the technical and policy levels to better prepare and respond to climate events in in the Caribbean? What what can we do better? Well, okay, I'll, I'll jump on that one first. So I think <laughs> we touched on a part of it there on the technical side in terms of developing the, the, the scenarios, the risk scenarios that are associated with um, a change in climate and uh, also looking at it through the lens of the various sectors as well. I think that's important. Um, I also think that there is a, a need at the, the technical level to look at the social dynamics of climate right. change. Right. And I, I, you know, I've been looking really at what we saw happening from Irma, Maria, what we saw happening in Dorian, um, the realities of the displacement of Caribbean populations, right. whether it be temporarily or permanently, in some cases that has happened, and also the psychosocial effects on the population. I think these, these are matters that we really are going to have to pay a lot more attention to. In addition, um, because of the significant threat to livelihoods um, that we have seen as a result of climate related um, hazards and the intensification of those hazards, whether it be the, the drought side of it or the extreme rainfall or through the winds of cyclonic activity, um, the reality is that social protection systems 
are going to have to be re-examined. Right. And if, right. if, even if we look at the example of what has happened in the region now with uh, COVID-19, I know it's a biological hazard, but I think that the, the, the protracted duration of COVID-19 and the implication on livelihoods, there are parallels that can be drawn with respect to what will potent, has already happened, but what will potentially happen more as we go forward over the years and we see the effects of climate change. So social protection systems are going to have to be reconfigured um, and really strengthened to be Augmented, able to absolutely, absolutely, absolutely yes. um, to, yes. deal, to deal with scenarios that we've not had in the past. So really we, we, we cannot use the past to, to fully predict what is going to be required in the future. And I think we have to be agile and flexible in terms of our national level systems to be able to treat with what is coming. Right. Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank so, you much. so much. Um, we're, 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 running we're running out of, out of time, time, Elizabeth. I would like to invite you to say any final words as we wrap up this very interesting discussion. Ian, thanks again so much, Carolyn. It's been great being here with um, Colin as well. I, I think the, the, the word I want to leave us with is about resilience. Mm -hmm. And we need to um, continue to work collaboratively as regional institutions on the whole issue of building resilience and looking at the economic dimensions, the physical and infrastructure dimensions, the environmental dimensions, social dimensions, and of course, how we integrate resilience into our operational readiness and also right, right. very importantly, recovery. And I, I just want to close off on the recovery point because this is an area that Sedima is going to be moving into now. We've been mandated by the heads of government to set up a recovery program at the coordinating unit. And there's gonna be a lot more coming forward um, on the regional front with respect to this and how we're gonna work better with our institutions to look at recovery, not just from climate related hazards, but other hazards as well. So thanks again for having me in the program. And, 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 thank, and thank, thank, you thank you so much. Um, Colin, can I invite you for final words? Yes, uh, uh, thank you so much for inviting both Liz and I uh, to this show to talk about climate change. Uh, it is one of the very important topics. Uh, we call it an ex existential threat uh, to the region. And I endorse all of what Liz uh, said just now, and I would like to add another word, that, and that is action. Mm -hmm. um, we absolutely need to act now mm -hmm. uh, to be able uh, to use the scarce resources we have, uh, to use that in a way that keeps climate change and climate mm -hmm. resilience in mind. Uh, we absolutely need uh, to educate our people. This is going to be a continuous effort and we thank uh, Colorblind and, and other media houses who continue to elevate this issue. Mm -hmm. I also want to um, indicate and, and to say that as a scientist uh, who, who look at climate change, we absolutely have to bridge the gap between the science and the real life right. uh, scenarios. And that too, just like how we have to educate our people, has to be something that we continuously. Uh, Absolutely. It's, a, it's an ongoing work. And uh, I just want to reiterate one other point that Liz mentioned, um, that all the CARICOM institutions have a role to play. Uh, and if we work together, then we can deliver on the mandates that we all have mm -hmm. uh, individually. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Colin and Liz. This has been a truly enlightening discussion, packed with tons of information. Thank both of you. Uh, for joining the conversation tonight and for providing such rich information on this topic. We will now take our final break. back to the final segment of the conversation for tonight. Climate change, that was our big topic tonight. Climate change is a global phenomenon that many Belizeans has fla have flagged as a technical war of words or as an issue for the big guys. But after our conversation tonight, 
There should be no doubt that climate change is, in fact, a clear and present danger for every one of us. And by everyone, I mean every single person that calls Earth home, including us here in Belize. Increasingly, troubling human activity on the planet, in addition to natural occurrences, have resulted in a rapidly increasing temperature of our planet, which in turn has resulted in more frequent violent storms, more rains, drier droughts, rising sea level, and financial pain for people ranging from North Korea and Central Africa to people living in uptown Jamaica and even in rural Belize district. All of us are truly affected. Every day, important talks are being held between international organizations and even between heads of states. But even us as individuals need to have the conversation. It is imperative that all of us make the needed adjustments in our daily lives to be kinder and more considerate of our environment, to reduce our own carbon footprint which can be as easy as carpooling a few times a month, turning off light bulbs when not in use, and enjoying fresh air versus air conditioning for extended periods. You see, as if our planet is driven beyond the point of no return, it is not the UN or America or China that will suffer. It is each and every one of us, and that suffering has already begun. Belize, it is past time to be more climate conscious. Let's all join the movement. With that, our time is up for tonight. Remember to join us on Mondays at 7 p.m. for new episodes of The Conversation right here on CBTV and on Colorblind's Facebook page. Good night and take care.